As many of you know, I have four boys, and I'm convinced that one of the reasons God gave us so many children is for our sanctification. We needed a greater understanding of sin. I don't mean the myriad of ways that plays out from a scarily young age in children, but in us as parents. Of course, it's not the reason we had children, but it certainly shows up your heart, doesn't it? Marriage does. Children do. Relationships do. Pressure does. Indeed, if we're willing to look, almost every moment of our life presents the opportunity to see our hearts for what they really are. And we often don't like what we see. As I mentioned in the welcome, the, the question Jacques asked a few weeks ago, what good can I speak and proclaim my Lord's salvation, it is the template for the next two weeks before we get back to the book of Acts. And the speaking of this talk that I want to encourage us to do with greater boldness is to speak of sin and God's judgment. You might say, well, thanks, Ray. At the beginning of 2021, it sounds so uplifting after what we've just endured in 2020. But David doesn't see it that way in Psalm 51. In fact, look at uh, what the desire for his lips, his speaking is. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Verse 14, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Verse 15, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. That sounds anything but morbid and depressing. Praise is an expression and an act of overflowing joy. But it comes from David's wrestle with the truth of his heart and the truth of his God's response to his sin. What can we learn from David's confession here? That we too, with open lips, will declare his praise for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ and for the sake of the dying world in the grip of a much more serious pandemic than COVID, the pandemic of spiritual death because of sin and God's judgment on it. Psalm 51 really is a model of repentance. And so I want to highlight in this first part four things about true repentance from this Psalm of David. And then in the second part of the sermon, we'll apply these truths to our speaking of sin to others. So firstly, true repentance knows that only one person can truly deal with my guilt. True repentance knows that only one person can truly deal with my guilt. It may seem obvious to state this, but this is David's cry of confession to God. This king petitions his king for forgiveness. Look at the cry of his confession. Have mercy on me, verse 1. Blot out my transgressions. Hide your face, verse 1 and verse 9. Verse 2 and verse 7. Wash, purge me with hyssop, as he says in verse 7, and I shall be clean. Some of you know your aromatic plants like thyme or marjoram, and hyssop is a reference to such a plant. The branches were often tied together to form a kind of brush that was dipped in water and used for cleansing rituals, like for lepers, much like we brush our meat on the briar with marinade. But David is effectively saying, cleanse me, God, inside out, lest I be burned up by the fire of your holiness. And so let's be clear, it's not to ritual that he's looking, but to God. It's not to a priest nor a pastor that he looks for absolution. It's not to some kind of penance nor prayer mantra that he believes will deal with his sin and salve his guilt. It's not to a psychologist or self-help guru or life coach that he turns, but to the author of life, to God and God alone. That very word repentance means a complete change of mind to the depth of my will and my affections. And it conveys a 180 degree turnaround from the direction of sin and living for self to God. But then that only makes sense, doesn't it? Only the one whom I have sinned against can forgive me. If I hurt you, you would be most upset if your friend stepped in and said, that's okay, Ray, I forgive you. Forgiveness is not his to grant. True repentance knows the direction I need to face and it's Godward. Only he can truly deal with my guilt and shine his light as it's coming through the window right now. Secondly, 
True repentance grasps the depth of my guilt and my deserved judgment. See, the truly penitent person cannot come any other way to God other than humbly on his knees, for he or she knows that sin, any sin, can mean nothing but shame before this perfect, holy, shiny God. Part of the attraction, I think, of the deviant gospels we hear so often preached these days is that they speak little of sin. People buy into the rhetoric that to focus too much on the fact that we are sinful human beings will psychologically damage us or give us a low self-esteem. And yet, contrary to our world and even many false teaching pulpits, Jesus says, those who are blessed are those who will be effective salt and light themselves are those who live repentant lives, who are constantly conscious of their sin. They are, Matthew 5, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Notice how how David fronts up to his sin, verse 3, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Verse 6, Rather, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, I have always been sinful. But I have not always acknowledged that, David could say. Indeed, we we know the cover-up of what's behind this psalm of the pregnant Bathsheba saga. One commentator tells it this way, David thought of a simple plan. First, recall Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, from duty. He was uh, on the front line in the army on some feeble pretext of wanting to get information about how the war was going on. Second, get Uriah to sleep at home that night and hopefully to sleep with his wife. Third, make sure Uriah was safely out on campaign once again when the baby was born. And fourth, falsify the date on the birth certificate. And Bob's your uncle, or rather David is. But of course it didn't go down like that at all. Uriah was far too maddeningly honorable. And so one sin led to another for David, eventually leading to the death, the murder of Uriah, with the help of Joab, his commander-in-chief. If the scandal was discovered then, never mind impeachment. But it all worked. And as the commentator says, there I guess David would have hoped it would end. He may have broken at least three of the Ten Commandments, but at least managed to keep the eleventh. Thou shalt not be found out. But it never does go away, does it? Guilt? It can't be covered up, though we try so hard. I must face it to properly deal with it in all its ugliness. There's a story told of an old mountaineer who had never seen much civilization. And one day, while wandering on the mountain, he found a mirror. He had never before seen a mirror. And so when he looked at his reflection, he said, My word, if it isn't a picture of my old pappy. He took the mirror home and thoroughly pleased with it, he hid it in his private possessions. About a week later, his wife was searching through his private possessions and found the mirror. She looked into it and said, Ha! So that's the ugly old witch he's been going around with behind my back all these years. It's a shock, isn't it, to see ourselves as we really are. So what do we do? We we make excuses. We blame others. It's as old as the garden. It's always their fault. Always something or someone else to blame. Or we, uh, we mask ourselves with righteous indignation. Very easy to talk about others' sin and our good deeds. I guess that's why we like scandal on TV, those series, because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Or we repress it and we think we can swat it away like a pesky mosquito that is interfering with our comfort. But that will not do. You see, the issue with sin is not that it merely has the potential to eke out somewhere, to create havoc or ruin lives, but that it brings us under the right judgment of God. That's the perilous thing about it. Verse 4, you are justified and blameless in your assessment of me, David says, and you rightly bring me under your condemnation. Verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken rejoice. He may be reflecting the effect of repressed sin and guilt that he is feeling it quite physically. But you have brought it about, he says. I am experiencing the right consequences of my sin under your righteous hand. <laughs> 
True repentance is not saying, well, I'm only human, nobody's perfect. It's not resolution like having a fresh one at the start of 2021. I promise not to do it again, or I'm sorry I didn't do that, I will try harder. It's not the shrug of the shoulders, regret or remorse that lasts but a moment and is actually more concerned with having got caught out or causing hurt to someone, as bad as that is. No, the truly repentant person is knocked flat and catches his breath at the reality that God has every right to turn his back on them in his perfect justice. Thirdly, true repentance confesses that we have loved our sin more than we have loved Jesus. I think that's what's behind David's controversial words in verse 4. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Had he not sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba, even the nation? Of course he had. But ultimately, all sin is against God and God alone, from whom we need forgiveness. But when we sin, it's us choosing to love our sin more than we love him, to love our way more than his ways. Listen to David's words, verse 6, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. Verse 11, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. In his mind, perhaps, is King Saul and how God took away his Holy Spirit from Saul. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. This is all the language of what God delights in, which David says, in my sin I fail to delight in. I delighted more in my way, in my sin. And true repentance sees that I have sinned because I've turned my back on the all-satisfying God. I was reading the testimony again of Jimmy Needham, the Christian musician, who was addicted to pornography since he was at age nine. And he says, real freedom came for me when I began by God's grace to see that my cravings were more than just for food and sex. My appetites were at root for an all-satisfying God. He will always be a better treasure, a more pleasing song. The music of the world pales into comparison to him. Notice finally that true repentance trusts God's willingness and ability to forgive me. As David ponders his heart, he doesn't get self-piteous, hopeless or morbid. He expresses a real want for things to be different, to truly change. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. David recognizes he needs heart surgery, not a band-aid. How we need to pray for a willing spirit, verse 12. Sometimes we just don't want to change, do we? But all of this crying out, this confession, this pleading with God for forgiveness would be worthless if God was not willing or able to forgive David nor us. But there is a great assurance throughout this psalm that the God he calls upon as abundantly merciful or full of steadfast love will indeed forgive. A broken and contrite heart you will not despise, O God, verse 17. Some commentators have pointed out that the verbs cleanse me or wash me, which are imperatives, could just as easily be translated in the future tense. You will cleanse me, you will wash me. David knew this God and he was confident that he would have intimacy with this God once more, which his sin had destroyed. And he knew this covenant God would pardon the truly repentant. How can I be sure God will accept me? Will he be merciful to me? Will he love me? Will he have me? Has he seen what I've done? What David knew from the Old Testament from his experience was one thing. But we know more. We know how exactly it is that God can forgive the sinner and remain righteous. How he can stay true to his promise to be found of those sinners who seek him earnestly. We see the shed blood of the Lamb. The sacrifice of his only son, Jesus, tells me that this is a God full of unfailing love, mercy and compassion. That the blood he shed is God's pledge that he will forgive the penitent not because we deserve it, but because of who he is. True repentance believes that God will indeed forgive sinners. Friend, do you believe it?
You must take a hold of it in faith. Do you believe it?